uh, Vice Chancellor, thank you. And uh, let me say what a pleasure it is to be back here in the Northwest. It's been the uh, <clears throat> background to a life in active politics in many different fields. And uh, it is um, a, a generalization which gives me huge pleasure to use that the place is unrecognizable to the Northwest that I remember when I was first involved as a newly elected member of parliament in 1966. But we all, in approaching a subject like this, uh, the competitiveness of the UK, we all have form. Uh, I have form, and uh, you, Vice Chancellor, have indicated something of the scale of it. I, I would be perfectly prepared to admit that some of the things I believed and said in the 1950s and 1960s were those of a small businessman who had started off with uh, a thousand pounds in, in uh, his post-university career and believed that the, the best possible thing would be for government to get out of the way, civil servants to disappear, forms to be torn up, and red tape to be used to string up anyone who survived. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, I think that this change of culture could not be better demonstrated than my first day as parliamentary undersecretary in the Ministry of Transport. The day before uh, the election campaign, I had been signing every voucher for petty cash over 50p on the simple basis there weren't that many 50ps around. And my first day in the ministry, they said, would you be kind enough to sign this minister? And what is this? I said, oh, it's, it's, it's just an authority to invest six million pounds in the electrification of a branch line in East Anglia. I said, well, I think I ought to see the manager. So, oh, minister, you can't possibly get involved in the detail <laughs> of, of, <laughs> of that sort, or you'll never get any work done. Um, uh, I, I went on to uh, become involved in the planning machine, in the reorganisation of local government, in the interface of giant industries, British aerospace conspicuously in this part of the world. Um, in one way or another, I worked closely with local government and local economic uh, people. Um, I suppose the most dramatically known one was the riots of 1981 in Liverpool. But uh, as the Vice Chancellor has said, many, many of the uh, activities that have been well documented in Manchester, at some stage or other, I have the privilege of being involved with. As Minister of Defence, one saw all the issues of procurement, the difficulties that come of uh, trying to decide whether you buy a, 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 an off-the-shelf fixed-price product or whether you develop it in your own industrial base and take the risks that follow from that. Uh, it, it has been an utterly fascinating uh, experience and I'm privileged to now have the opportunity to talk about it. And, and the, I start by saying that my considered view after all that experience is that no modern economy can operate without the public and the private sectors understanding and respecting each other so that they work together in a way that augments national interest. Uh, my own view is that the British Civil Service is a Rolls Royce, but no Rolls Royce will get anywhere without petrol or a driver, and that's what really ministers need to be about. So, um, the other generalisation I would make is that talking about competitiveness, if you have, you make a 45 minute speech or something of that sort, the journalist at the door will say to you, what are the three big things that we should put in our headline? And of course, the moment that you get taken down that road, you talk about things like tax and infrastructure, and everybody sighs a great sigh of relief because it's nothing to do with them. They can't affect tax, they can't affect infrastructure, and oh, well, no one's going to turn the spotlight on me. And in benign circumstances, very few people ask the question for very obvious reasons, because it's easier to get agreement, to do things, uh, confidence is high, the banks are willing to lend, interest rates tend to be affordable, and governments have got more cash to spend, and companies have got customers. Well, of course, that was the world economy 
of a fur f few years ago, but it has its dangers. And its dangers, of course, is that precisely because things seem all right, the pressure to change is much less. And uh, um, because everybody tends to be surviving, companies are not going out of business, whatever it may be, uh, even when they do make bad decisions, because the market overwhelms the, the mistakes and human frailty has fewer consequences. Uh, in good times, it also leads to introspection and to focus on past performance about how we are doing now, Ex avoiding the key question, which is what happens if you're trying to decide about international comparisons, is how are we comparing with other economies? So uh, you don't tend to be so worried about comparisons overseas or how others are doing if you're doing well yourself. If GDP is growing and turnover is expanding and profits are larger, because everybody tends to be richer as the year passes and there's not that much to worry about. Or is there? In his most recent visit to Europe, the Chinese Premier placed a billion pounds of orders in the United Kingdom. Terrific headline. Not such a big headline three days later when he placed 14 billion pounds worth of orders in the German economy. And that's a valid comparison because uh, uh, we and the Germans are part of advanced economies. They have sophisticated consumers at home and abroad and they are subject virtually to the same economic pressures as we are. So the relative success of selling to China should be telling us something about the relative performance of our economies, not just the fact that Germany has managed successfully to retain its strength in manufacturing whilst the UK has favoured financial services. I have to make two important qualifications. Many British companies are world class. Their products are excellent and their management have the will and resource to commit to the search and development to keep them that way. When I was running the DTI, we're now back in the 1990s, I was advised that this generalization of world class applied to 40% of British companies. The figure for Germany was 60%. <coughs> The second qualification follows from the first. Uh, we're not judged by the standards of our best. GDP reflects average. The average achievements of the 40% have to be balanced by the underachievements of the 60%. There is no short-term fix. The most widely used measure of economic performance in, economic, in international comparisons is GDP per head. In 1970, Germany's GDP per head was 6% higher than the UK's. Despite the enormous costs of absorbing East Germany, it was still 4% ahead in 2010. Germany's economic performance has been driven by its industrial performance. Germany's dynamic industrial sector has performed better, even absorbing social costs because they achieved the productivity gains to pay for them, and it has been this that has sustained their economic performance. Over many years, the German government has been supportive of its industrial base with high levels of publicly funded research and development so that it augments that of its companies. Its product standards have been maintained by the DIN system, and the DIN system is a national system that forces up the standards of production of industrial manufacture between firms in their domestic market, leading to stronger performance in export markets. And high standards, of course, <coughs> the need to constantly innovate, have demanded innovation by firms. But this has been in addition to the stimulus of government. Companies have also learnt to work collectively through strong supply chains and compulsory members of the Chambers of Commerce. Education standards have been consistently high 
and apprenticeships valued by public and private sectors alike. In the UK, there are just 11 apprenticeships for every 1,000 employees. It is four times the size in Germany, 40 per 1,000. And remember that in Germany, apprenticeships are funded by the private sector. And in the UK, they're state-funded. And finally, the German banks appear to have regarded themselves as servants of industry, not the masters. And if you add all this up, it amounts to an industrial strategy as well as an economic strategy. It is applied with huge consistency of purpose, and this has greatly helped the German industrial companies to plan with confidence into the future. So let's turn the spotlight in and look at the position in the UK. Since 1997, there have been 10 different Secretaries of State at the Department of Business. Now, that, that is a party political point, and I could rest at that, having made a devastating criticism of the last Labour government to the cheers of Tories in the audience. <laughs> Unfortunately, the previous government had no better a record. There was the same turnover. And if you actually take the stark figures taking the two governments from 97 onwards, there were three of us, David Young, Peter Mendelssohn and myself, who did nine of the 21 years. For all the other years, it was basically one a year. Imagine running a university with a new vice chancellor every year. You only have to think of it to realize there is a devastating implication to be seen. And like in Germany, central government in the UK is hugely powerful and functionally monopolistic. Ministers think of housing, education, roads, transport. What they don't think about is Birmingham or Manchester or Liverpool or the other great city estates of this country. I can only remember one occasion in my years in public life, in government, when a cabinet considered a place, and that was in 1981, the October of 1981, when I wrote that report, it took a riot about my experiences in Liverpool. So we have now got a minister for the cities, and that at least begins to recognise this need to think about place and the inspiration and relevance of policies to the local wealth generating and socially providing communities. In terms of industrial policy, there are serious deficiencies. Knowledge of business, what I call sponsorship, what I think is generally regarded as the responsibility of different individual Whitehall departments. Each industry is sponsored by some department or other. A significant contribution towards an industrial strategy would require a clarification of, by departments as to how they actually help their sponsored industries to win. With the expertise they possess, the support they contribute, and how this would compare with best international practice. In Germany, regional and local government are much closer to their industries, and they are very knowledgeable about the performance of those industries. In the United Kingdom, we have closed the regional development agencies and government offices, they've gone, and they're now relying on local economic partnerships, which, at its most optimistic, will take time to bed in. The UK approach to policy can often consist of wholesale <coughs> dismemberment of established institutions that are considered unsuccessful, rather than changes to those institutions to overcome the perceived weaknesses, but retaining the strengths. It's not just a question of the regional development agencies. Anyone remember the training and enterprise councils, uh, which were then replaced by the learning and skills councils? In the UK, our media focuses not on industry, but on financial markets and share prices. The Today programme has a regular slot on markets every day. 
The number of serious industrial correspondents in our national newspapers can be counted on the fingers of one hand. The city is driven by short-term business performance and the quarterly results of the fund managers. There is no long-term attitude to ownership. Shareholders tend to act as if they were absentee landlords, content to turn a blind eye to weak management performance and prepared to sell if the going gets rough. In the UK, in the trade association, with some praiseworthy exceptions, they see their role as to lobby the government rather than ever admit that their perfor members' performance could be part of the problem. And the former is very important. Our sectoral supply chains are weak and the Chambers of Commerce, funded by voluntary membership and therefore always waiting to listen to someone articulate their case rather than turn the spotlight of criticism on them. But even the Chambers are very patchy in size and performance. Our education system, to put it mildly, uh, has been the subject of endless organisational change with little evidence, well, no evidence actually, that the quality of its output has improved relative to our competitors. We still have, and these are the figures that come from the Department of Education themselves, about 40% of our children not getting five good GCSEs, including maths and English. Well, this would suggest that in all these reorganizations, we haven't actually concentrated much on what really matters. And what really matters is the quality of teaching. The present Education Secretary, Michael Gove, said recently, if we want to have an education system that ranks with the best in the world, then we need to attract the best people to teach and to give them outstanding training. He was perhaps too polite to say, we also need to change the head teachers in schools that persistently underperform. There was a headline in the newspapers this week, bad teachers should be paid less. I, I still can't get over the implications. Bad teachers should be sacked. It's as simple as that, before they ruin another generation of kids who come out without the appropriate qualifications for an ever more sophisticated world. But the outcome of the education system also depends on culture and on the aspirations of young people and their parents. These are high for some of our people, particularly in the Asian communities, but for far too many, they're too low, and changing those aspirations is a difficult challenge. Enthusiasm for apprenticeships has waxed and waned in government and has never been present in UK business to the same extent as it is in our competitor nations. Fortunately, there is now an upsurge in interest and they're becoming valued again by government. And there's some excellent, as I've constantly said, there are excellent employers, Rolls-Royce, BAE Systems in this area, who've always recognised the worth of training through formal apprenticeships. But it is not the best that set the average standard. It is the average that we are concerned with. Now, of course, one can easily portray the problems and lose sight of the successes, because all is not gloom. It is ironic that in a country inclined to derive the concept of an industrial strategy, saying we haven't got one, we don't believe in it, at its extreme, close down the DTI, you must have read all that in your newspapers, uh, the fact is, our two most successful industries are very close to government. We have a very strong pharmaceutical industry in this country, uh, which may have something to do with the fact that the health service is supported by all political parties and funding has been consistently protected and high standards maintained. But the procurement is regulated by government and standards are maintained by government. We have a strong defence and aerospace sector, which you know, but has that got something to do with the fact that the UK defence funding is still relatively high compared with other countries and that governments of all political persuasions since the end of the Second World War have been willing to support Rolls-Royce and Airbus with long-term loans and research funding? Our defence sector has received huge government help in overseas markets 
and certainly more, much more proportionately than the rest of UK industry. So the relative relationship between government and industry is demonstrated in the fact, if not in the theory which many people advocate. Government play a crucial role in attracting inward investment into our economy. Our automotive sector has recovered well under foreign ownership. Governments of both parties have recognised that without investment by the global players, we would not have a UK supply chain. And a great deal of attention is now going on in government to look at that model and extend it across a wider horizon. It may be no accident as well for all these sectors that there are civil servants in the, in the Department of Health, the Department of Business and the Ministry of Defence who have a deep <coughs> knowledge of how those industries operate. But whether there are enough people who have changed in and out of the public and private sector often leads to rather embarrassing questions. We've been very fortunate that some foreign owners of UK-based businesses take a very long-term view and in, have consequently invested consistently and well. You only have to think of the plans we've recently heard from Toyota and Nissan and Jaguar to realise that that inward investment has been good for the United Kingdom. It has introduced better management and hugely improved the quality of the product and the processes which have led to world-class productivity standards. <laughs> you will, I think, by now have some clues as to what I think an industrial strategy should contain. I'll summarise this a little later. But first of all, I want to say what an industrial strategy is not about. A good industrial strategy is not about currencies. Devaluation gives, at best, short-term benefits. Currencies reflect competitiveness. They do not cause them. Much dialogue about industrial policy focuses on deregulation. And there is considerable justification for some of those concerns. But it is not all one way. Germany has not succeeded through deregulation. Uh, I would guess that Germany is one of the most tightly regulated and the most rigorously enforced economies operating in Europe. Regulations therefore provide benefits and opportunities for business, as well as running the risk of adding to costs and workload. There was a survey by McKinsey's in, 19, in 2009 which showed that 38% of businesses regarded new laws as positive, with 40% being negative. Well, uh, of course, that does show a negative result. But you can't ignore the fact that the margin is much smaller than you might have perceived because many companies depend upon the opportunities that regulations have created. It's important to realise that the market knows no morality. The conditions which could prevail without regulation would be wholly unacceptable in the modern world. And the social underpinning, the social provision that we call civilization, is actually government created by regulation and law. And so the assumptions we make about everyday entitlement have usually got an, a, a legislative framework behind them. And it is unthinkable that that will be removed or seriously reduced. The conclusion that I take is that any dialogue about regulation can only be conducted against a background of detail. There have been many deregulation initiatives, and I have been part of them, and I have to say at once that I don't think I had any success. Um, and there were many reasons. The, the, the most obvious is the point I made, that social underpinning is part of modern civilization, and no government is going to try, let alone want, to get rid of that broadly acceptable lifestyle, which is, we call civilization. Um, and the fact of the matter is, if you are a minister, and it's your career that is poised on the brink of a deregulation initiative, the thought of getting off somebody's back can rapidly turn into a thought about whose back you're actually getting off. And just try tinkering with maternity ben benefits when <coughs> Mumsnet gets going in an election campaign. 
As I say, some regulations create industries. Just take the compulsory wearing of crash helmets is but one example. Uh, huge numbers of people make the crash helmets, as well as saving fortunes in the health service. Uh, of course, I would be the first to argue um, that we should get rid of outdated red tape. And the government's initiative of you can only bring a new regulation in if you get a new, an old one out is a good discipline. Um, but I also think we should be looking at every new piece of legislation, uh, at every new regulation, and see if there's any way in which it can be turned to UK's industrial advantage. And let us have, you only have to look at the pipeline of European processes of yet to come to realise that the, there will be a continuing debate about the broadening of social underpinning that the European single market represents. Now, there's another um, silly uh, term of abuse which we hear in the concept of an industrial strategy. Governments shouldn't try to pick winners. I'm not quite sure what they should try to pick if they don't try to pick winners. But anyway, we all know they mustn't pick winners. But the truth is that governments have to make choices in a whole range of policy, from financial funding to procurement to regulation. And the key is to think in terms of backing the winners, not bailing out losers. It's not about favouring manufacturing or services. A significant proportion of the added value of manufacturing comes from research and development and design, in addition to the manufacturing process. Manufacturing and services are now interlinked, and both are part of that process of raising the standard of UK PL PLC. And it's not about concentrating on high intellectual jobs or even about some fashionable industrial sectors. We have to provide too many jobs, often low skilled for that. It's, you see it, just sort out the infrastructure, just go for the growth industries, go for the new brick markets, as though this lies a solution. If you actually stand back from it, if you were a Martian thinking about it on your first day here, you would say, how many, what is the size of the workforce? To what extent can we project what that workforce will consist of? How many people want educational qualifications? What skills? In 10, 20, 30 years' time. And what sort of jobs will they be doing? Well, it doesn't take very long for a list of sort of jobs to come out. And the more you start producing the list, the more you realise that believing that new technology or exporting to Brazil is going to transform the employment profile of this country, the more ridiculous the idea becomes. Because the truth of the matter is that a huge proportion of our people are going to be looking after old people, are going to be cleaning the streets, are going to be in the construction industry, in the logistics industry, in the hotel industry, in tourism. Uh, and whilst the, 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 the uh, uh, horizontal wave of... Uh, um, uh, educational requirements will rise as new technology spreads into everything that we do, the fact is that there will still be a huge number of relatively low-skilled jobs that have to be fitted and a very large number of people who will never be educated above a level where they can do much else except those sort of jobs. So just going for the slick excuse and looking for some diversion of resource like do more investment infrastructure is to miss the point of what competitiveness across an economy is actually about. Um, so, um, come back to where I, uh, I promised I would. Um, what, what are the key ingredients of an industrial strategy? Well, I haven't the slightest doubt that first, and <laughs> in a sense, first, 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 and first again, is education and training. And because people matter more than anything else. Our education and training system determines the skills and the talents of our workforce. And there has got to be a relentless drive to improve the educational achievements of our children, not just a narrow elite within that cohort. And that, of course, follows on that business has to play its role in increasing the scale and quality of training. Secondly, our national infrastructure, airports, ports, roads, rail, power, telecoms, they are all part of the underpinning of our national economy. And again, 
it is absolutely right that we've got to do it. But if you then get the statistics for all our competing economies, they've, got, they've worked that out for themselves. They're all doing it as well. So just to stand still, we have to increase the scale of the investment that we're making. To get ahead, we have to do it better and faster than our competitors. And exactly the same applies in research and development. But there's a word of caution. We must compare ourselves uh, to the performance of our competitors and not just take the output statistics comparing ourselves with what we were five, ten years ago. Uh, it's extremely good news for the south of England that Crossrail is being built. But how long has it taken to get to the point where they decided to go ahead with the project? And then you see what others are doing with the RER in Paris, with the Shinkansen trains that have been running in Japan for over 50 years, and our European competitors have way ahead of us in the development of those fast rapid transport systems. Um, I hesitate to use the word airport, but the battle or the debate that is now going on about airport uh, capacity in the south of England is uh, 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 absolutely key to Britain's competitiveness uh, overseas because the continent is already building these huge airports which have got all the interchange with the new economies. We haven't got the flight capacity to take the new lines that the new economies will be, uh, demand we open up. So British people are going to have to go to the continent to get the connections. And you only have to think of that and realise it's just one more step backwards in the relative international competitive race. I, I stressed at the very beginning my belief in a constructive relationship be between government and the private sector in which they must work together in the national interest. Because the government does have the ability to influence economic performance positively. Whether it's through the effective administration of the planning system or in helping our companies to be more competitive and to win in the export markets. But you have to also to recognise the role of the private sector in working constructively with governments. Because the private sector, they know the markets better than any government ever can. They know the strength of the competition they're up against, and therefore they can take judgments about what help they need in competing with that. And so we need officials who understand the culture of both sides, not officials who see themselves as public sector servants and private sector people who don't have high regard for the public service. We need to, the interchange of culture so they can work more successfully together. And it follows in that we need trade associations uh, that understand that this is a deeply competitive process out there in this world today. And it's no use sending trade association representatives to meet their sponsoring department with a list of complaints about what the government is doing wrong because the civil servants will simply take notes, send a brief summary to the minister saying they came in again, the same old stuff, and it'll all be lost to sight. The civil servants have got to be well informed about the industry, the industry's got to be constructive about its own performance, and then you can have a worthwhile dialogue about matters that are genuinely um, something that could be improved by better relationships or more positive government action. But simply a sort of Windsor's charter, that is not going to get you very far. Well, I make two suggestions. First of all, we need longer postings for civil servants. Uh, moving them around, that doesn't do any good at all because the, the expertise is con constantly diluted. And we need more interchange with the, with the private sector, moving people in and out. And that will deepen the relationship and the understanding. And I think it would add to the UK's industrial capacity. And it's, it's not rocket science. I'm only talking about the way other competing economies operate their relationships, public and privately. Uh, we then, my fourth area, is a supportive financial sector. Now, I'm the first to recognise that the financial services sector is a strength and deserves the full support of government in maintaining the preeminence that the City of London and other uh, 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 centres of excellence in the UK have achieved. 
But it also does raise questions about the need to be more supportive of the wealth creating sector throughout the UK. The, the clearing banks themselves, I think, are now beginning to recognize that the old relationship banking, which was characteristic of 30 years ago, should not have been undermined by computer testing applications to decide whether loans are relevant or not. And I think they are now beginning to talk in terms of returning to a pattern of relationship banking when you actually knew the name of your <laughs> bank manager and he was probably based locally in the community. Um, the, 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 the fifth is, is uh, self-evident and, and that is a tax system that encourages individual and corporate endeavour and is able to produce the revenues to fund the public services but leaves in the hands of the wealth creators the funds to regenerate and develop their own capabilities. So levels of tax need to be internationally competitive in this globalised world and it is just as important to gain consent electorally from the, for, for the, 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 the fair tax system that those who are appropriately assessed are made to pay. In other words, tax evasion and any dubious sort of fringe type activities are stamped down on the government in order that they persuade a sophisticated electorate of the need to allow individual tax receipts. Now I want to come on to uh, a subject which is of very great importance in this uh, particular borough, which is the role of uh, directly elected mayors. Uh, you may have noticed that uh, there are referenda going on in this country today in 10, ten cities and um, to move from the council system to uh, direct elected mayors. And I, I'm not going to forecast what's going to happen. I only know that in Liverpool they have moved there, Leicester they've done it, Salford they have done it. And um, I personally believe that this is absolutely fundamental in changing the way in which our economy is run. Go back 200 years. The great economic centres of this country were built by broadly an entrepreneurial class. They were built broadly by people in pursuit of wealth. That was the, the, the drive and they did it magnificently. It was enormously helped by the fact that the market, the world market was ours and it was reinforced by district commissioners and the whole might of the most uh, advanced military power in the world at that time. The social conditions of the people were often awful and for the very desirable reasons the uh, democratic process over those 200 years has shifted the emphasis of local government or local leadership because they're not quite the same thing into a, a position where the wealth creators and drivers have been very largely replaced in the local economy by the social underpinning that local government represents. So the councils of today are broadly about the environment, education, the uh, social services, uh, the, the, the refuse collections, the potholes, but you name it, that's the sort of thing they do, housing. And in London, there is a ministry thinking along those lines, sending out circulars, dishing out cash for specific functions, each with their branch manager, call him a county surveyor to the Ministry of Transport, a housing manager to the DCLG, I think it's called now. And you begin to see that we have created functional monopolies based on London, based on consensual concepts of what you should be doing in each of these, with branch office locally, and at the same time, the power to determine local initiatives has been dramatically undermined, not for the least reason that in London they don't rank local government as being much good at it. And this is not a party political point. Government after government has taken power away from local government, created quangos uh, to do their bidding, um, in my party, uh, it was the housing departments of local government which were broadly taken away to create the housing corporation which was a central government quango. But you can go on, all governments have done it. And so quite unlike anything that is happening in the rest of the advanced economic world, we are running functional monopolies from London 
with very dramatic control over what local authorities could do. Switched right away from the original drive, which was to create wealth. Why I believe so strongly in the directly elected mayor is because I want to end this process whereby groups of councillors, largely elected for social provision reasons, behind closed doors, choose a leader acceptable to them, and then run the authority at the behest largely of the London spending departments. I want to see somebody who stands up in Salford or Liverpool or Manchester and says, this is my plan. This is the action I pretend to take on behalf of this city or this borough, and I will come back in four years' time and I will tell you whether I've been able, you will, you will judge whether I did it or not. That's what every other economy of our sort is doing, and I've seen it all over the world, the most dramatic of them all, was um, Hokkaido, not part of the normal trans travel plan of most people. It's the northern island of Japan, and I met the mayor of Sapporo, which is the northern city of Hokkaido, and it's under permafrost from November to March. That's the sort of economic conditions you've got to deal with. And he, is, he was a, a live wire. He had a thousand things he was going to do to make Sapporo into a world-class city. Now, most of them would fail. He'd have another thousand the next day. And he would come up, he did come up, he gave me all the brochures, he gave me all the, the, the sales talk, exactly what anyone with a corporate plan would do. And um, if he, he would then go to Tokyo and say, this is my plan, back me. That's totally different to waiting to see what the Ministry of Housing's latest initiative is the Salford. And uh, so uh, I expand on it because it's relevant today. I don't know what's going to happen. It is being fiercely resisted by local councillors because it is a challenge to their authority. It is. I accept that. And so it should be because if you only have to look at the education system in this country to realise what local government has failed to do, which is to get the standards that are world class. So I want to see a directly elected person in charge. And uh, we will see where we get. But whatever happens today, the, this issue is not going away. We, are going to, we will sooner or later get to the point where we do have local identification and local power. Uh, Salford has been very brave in making that decision. Um, finally, continu continuity and consistency, in my view, are a very important part of this desire to try and get consistent improvement. And I think the costs of change, frankly, are often underestimated by government. There are always reorganisations when a new government comes in, but they, they often cause massive disruption and frustration for customers and civil servants, but there is a terrific temptation to say we have a new department. They are exactly the same civil servants, they're in exactly the same building, but there's a new name on the door. And, uh, you know, that can be very debilitating and time-consuming. This government, I think, has been rather better at avoiding the rearrangement of the deck chairs in Whitehall. And again, it's the same phenomenon. New minister wants a new initiative. Um, whether it's a specific stimulus for the latest or the fashionable growth centre, but this forgets the fact that there is a huge economy out there that is not affected by these small initiatives around the place because there are no quick fixes in this competitive race. Um, so I, I think that what, government, what industry really wants is a government which has a long-term strategy, which it spells out, works day by day with industries and their representatives to make sure it's being implemented is not rigid, but flexible, that responds to markets where appropriate, but doesn't respond to political pressures when the going gets rough, because uh, as you see today, we, there's a battle saying now we've got to ease up on our rebalancing of the economy because it's getting uncomfortable. It is, going, yeah, it is uncomfortable. We all know it in business. We know it. But there is no <laughs> serious alternative, and no one I know in other, in other parts of the world has found a serious alternative. So uh, the need for consistent strategy, the need to apply it, the need to recognise the interdependence of the public and the private sector, the need to recognise that globalism is imposing disciplines on the nation states which they can't resist and will never will be able to resist again. We have to have conditions in this country which will attract footloose, footloose foreign investment. 
rule of law, fiscal incentives, training and sites available, higher educational standards. This is what brings people into economies such as ours. And uh, in the battle to do that, um, we need all the resources that is available to us. Because industrial policy, it's about the long term. It is essentially about detail. And I, no one more than me understands the imperative for a headline. However attractive a new initiative may be, it carries the danger that it attracts attention away from the detailed effort needed for industrial success in every company and every individual involved in the wealth creating sector, both public and private, in the country. We have to raise the performance of tens of thousands of companies and millions of our citizens. Well, that's the challenge, but it's not much of a headline. Thank you.